All right, so we are getting started. Very special welcome to everyone who is tuning in for tonight's webinar. We have a very interesting topic. Thank you to all who have signed up and tuning in. If this is your first webinar with EBFA, uh, very special welcome. Please do not um, hesitate to check out our education. If you are a returning supporter of EBFA in our education and our webinars, very special welcome to you as well. Before we jump into the topic, real quick, I'm going to go over some of the business side of things. Uh, first is that this is definitely being recorded. So if you happen to get disconnected or you have to sign off for any reason or you want to listen to it again, it will be recorded and it will be sitting on the EBFA. A YouTube channel, which is youtube.com backslash EBFA fitness. You will also get an emailed recording of this as well. If you are looking to get the PowerPoint, just in case if we're going over a lot of topics and you want to see the PowerPoint, you can email me education at ebfafitness.com and we will send you that PowerPoint. So we are going to get started jumping into this. After I go through the content of the webinar, we will be going through some questions, just in case if you have those, please type those in in the questions tab of the control panel. This is a, uh, not a teaser, but we'll call it a teaser, of a session that I'm doing at the Brain Awaken Awakening Lecture Series. That's October 26th in Arizona. This is also going to be recorded and housed online. The entire Brain Awakening series on October 26th is accessible online after the date, just in case if you cannot go to Arizona or if you are looking to get away and spend some time in sunny Arizona, please check it out. October 26th, Brain Awakening, BarefootStrongSummit.com. Jumping in into today's Topic. We are looking at the, the gut brain access and the way that you can use or modify your microbiome, microbiota, to modify, improve your mood, your patient's mood, and your client's mood. My background, real quick I am the founder of EBFA Global and uh, inventor of Nobosa Technology. I am a clinician. I'm a functional podiatrist, human movement specialist. I'm doing my fellowship in functional medicine through the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine. And that's where I explore a lot of my uh, passions outside of simply human movement and feet podiatry uh, and really look at how I can apply holistic concepts, functional medicine concepts uh, into my patient's treatments or my patient's protocol, uh, understanding and appreciating the role of inflammation, the role of stress, uh, the role of mind-body connections really on every aspect of our well-being and our movement. So that really is the voice at which uh, I'm looking at today's topic and why I uh, really started exploring gut-brain access was how I can apply it with my patients um, within myself as well and of course my family. Uh, already mentioned this, I'll mention it towards the end again. As we jump into the webinar, some fun facts about our gut microbiome, just to kind of get the wheels turning and get us excited for the topic, is that 100 times more genes than, our, than is in the human genome. So the gut microbiome is quite, quite, quite extensive. Obviously, it goes back millions and millions of years before uh, humans were around. So it's a quite fascinating area of the body. A lot of people will reference that your gut bacteria actually knows uh, decisions. So when you're thinking of intuition and gut feeling, your gut bacteria is actually processing uh, some of those decisions and helping you make these decisions without you consciously realizing it from a higher uh, neocortex perspective, uh, which is quite interesting. Your GI system, so the surface area of your GI systems is 100 times the size of the surface area of your external skin. 
Now, why that's so fascinating is that if you think of how sensory rich your hands and your feet, your, your eyes, your ears, and the world around us, and we're trying to bring in all of that sensory information, your internal sensory uh, environment is so much larger than your external. So if you are not exploring the power of your interoceptive system, your visceral fascial system, um, really the, the vagus nerve and everything that I'm speaking about, it's so powerful and it's so influential to every aspect of our well-being, our happiness, uh, and of course our movement and recovery. Uh, the weight of your gut bacteria is equal to or greater than the human brain. So that's approximately one kilogram or a little over two pounds. So really interesting. Your gut is often referred to as your second brain. So your second brain would be your enteric nervous system or your gut. Now, we were once thought to be born sterile. I'm going to reference that a little bit more uh, in the next uh, couple slides, that we are, in fact, not born sterile, but we are introduced to bacteria in utero. And then the last fun fact is that neurotransmitters are found in the gut at levels that are equal to those in the brain. Now, one of the neurotransmitters, serotonin, which is kind of our happy, feel good hormone, is actually, you can see 90% of serotonin is produced in the gut. This is why we're referencing this topic of could we modify or how do we modify our mood by our gut biome. So, Introduction to the gut-brain axis. This is a bi-directional axis that communicates via your autonomic nervous system. Very powerful. This, of course, has to do with sympathetic, parasympathetic, and our vagus nerve. So when you're thinking gut-brain axis, that communication is going to be very deep into the health and the tone of your vagus nerve. Gut-brain axis also communicates through your immune system. So this is where inflammation would start to play a role and via hormones as well. The power of your gut-brain axis is evident in psychiatric and neurological illnesses that are often associated with GI pathology. So really interesting that you can start to see a correlation or a uh, associations in those who are experiencing IBS or Crohn's or other GI pathology, and they also uh, suffer or experience um, uh, associated depression or anxiety. So some sort of mental diagnosis in conjunction with that GI diagnosis. Um, interesting to see that there's a lot of research around autism. I do not focus on that in this PowerPoint, but if that is something that you're interested in, there is a lot of research out there about using probiotics and modifying the gut biome as a treatment, either in the prevention of autism or in the symptoms of those who are uh, already diagnosed with autism. Parkinson's is another big one as well. So our goals in this webinar are to introduce you to the gut microbiota, how it's developed, the role of the vagus nerve in optimizing gut-brain access communication. Inflammation is a key aspect of gut health. And when our inflammation starts to get a little bit thrown off from the gut perspective, what that does to our overall system. And then what are the probiotics or the microbes that you should be taking or are suggested to be taking to modify your mood. So are we born sterile? I already told you that we are not born sterile. We are introduced to bacteria. I was reading some of the research articles that showed that you can um, actually find bacteria, maternal bacteria in the amniotic fluid. And then this is, of course, getting to uh, start to be introduced in utero. And this is my beautiful daughter. So bacteria is introduced in utero. Bacteria and bacterial DNA is found in the umbilical cord blood, the placenta, meconium, which is the first poop of the baby. So if they're seeing and tracking um, the gut bacteria through fecal matter, that's really how it's assessed. If you're finding 
that bacteria in a baby's first poop, obviously that is suggesting and supportive that uh, we are introduced to bacteria before we are introduced, before the vaginal delivery um, and skin-to-skin -skin contact or breastfeeding. So really uh, important to understand that and the role that perhaps the maternal gut biome has on her child or the fetus's gut biome. So this is multi-generational of how we should be thinking of uh, the power of gut biome. Now, uh, why this is important is that we're already beginning to shape our gut lining and brain communications in utero. Um, and that's really an important role of your gut bacteria is in that gut lining. We'll go into that in a few slides and the blood brain barrier. So how we establish that has to be uh, initiated before birth. Now, newborn gut microbiota is greatly influenced by the mode of delivery. So the mode of delivery, whether it's vaginal or cesarean, is of course influencing the bacteria that the child is going to be introduced to. Vaginal, you're getting a, a plethora of healthy bacteria that you're introduced to that you unfortunately are not introduced when it is a cesarean birth. The fecal matter, this is also really important of uh, some of the research studies that I was reading, is the sterility of birth and how we try to make it um, super, super sterile and uh, almost medicalizing birth has actually um, taken away certain types of bacteria introduction to the uh, newborn baby, and that can be deleterious to the establishment and the um, shaping of the blood-brain barrier and neurotransmitters and the nervous system and emotion. Um, you know, it's a really powerful influence when the child is not introduced to certain bacteria. Fecal matter is a very uh, important one, which um, for those who have never gone through birth or didn't know that, that uh, the child being introduced to the fecal matter is really important aspect of birth. So pooping during birth, totally normal, is actually beneficial. Um, so there's no consensus about the timing at which there's this difference. So if you see a healthier gut microbiome in a vaginally delivered baby, versus a cesarean born, is there a time that you will actually see that their gut microbiome uh, becomes equal and normalizes? Is that possible? Or if it's not, what are things that we could do to try to offset the fact that perhaps the child has to be born by a cesarean? So what could we give to the, to the baby to try to balance this out a little bit? What they've seen is that you can offset some of the downside to the gut microbiome in a cesarean with a breastfeeding and then that can start to establish um, an equal playing field as far as a gut biome. Now what happens if you do a vaginal birth and you formula feed? What does what happens to the child's uh, gut biome? So we want to always factor those in. Building your microbiota at birth is critical. So this is where you're really establishing that individual's gut biome for the rest of their life. Now, this is a dynamic environment, so you can continuously shape it. You could take probiotics, your what you eat, your stress levels, all of that is continuously affecting your gut biome. But the initial potential of that gut biome and what we're going to see is some critical periods of development occur in the newborn baby that needs to have that optimal gut biome. So the colonization of the infant gut is critical to healthy growth of metabolic, immune, brain development, cognition, emotion, really powerful. Some of the first colonizers that we see in the infant gut are uh, anaerobic bacteria such as Staph, Strep, Enterococcus. Now what's interesting is they reduce the oxygen levels that initially is found in the newborn gut and it paves the way for a lot of the other bacteria that is really important in the development of the nervous system. 
breastfed babies, the bacteria that you want to be thinking of, breastfed babies have a higher uh, concentration or they're dominated by this uh, bifidobacteria uh, bacteria or their microbiota is concentrated with this bacteria. Now this is as opposed to formula fed. Can you supplement by giving probiotics to the newborn of bifidobacteria? Absolutely, 100%. So there are ways that you can offset some of these differences that we're seeing based off of feeding style. Now, the newborn microbiota is continuously evolving and shaping, and they see that it matches the adult or is closest to an adult gut microbiota around three years of life. Now these are two uh, infant probiotics that are recommended. Let's say if you are doing a formula fed uh, regimen for a newborn, Avivo is Bifidobacteria uh, uh, infantis, I apologize, B infantis. And I'm gonna reference that one again in a little bit. This is a um, sole, probiotic so it's one specific bacteria that the the child is taking the soothe is lactobacillus root rootery now both of these are really critical for infant gut development i wanted to list these just in case if there are uh any mamas or those that have young um babies that you're trying to optimize their gut biome and perhaps they were on antibiotics after they were born or you were formula fed or what's interesting is that if you the mother was formula fed and not breastfed you might not have b infantis the bacteria to give to your child so in my case my mother formula fed us and but I'm, I'm breastfeeding my daughter, but because I was formula fed and because of everything that I'm researching, I want to make sure that she has all of the potential to develop her nervous system and her emotional system and her stress pathways and her vagal pathways uh, as optimally as possible. So we are doing supplements. These are two of the supplements that we're doing um, for my daughter. B. infantis, Evivo, this is L. rudery. Now there's critical periods of development. This is why it's so important for the infant to have an optimal gut biome, is that there's critical periods of development that occur in the newborn baby that is based off of the gut biome. This includes the number of serotonin receptors, your HPA axis development. That is one of the most important ones. The B infantis is linked to the development of the HPA axis and the uh, potential of the child to manage their stress pathway via the HPA axis. And then another key one that is linked to newborn gut biome is hippocampal neurogenesis. Your hippocampus is where you do your learning and your memory. So that's, of course, a um, very important structure that we want to make sure is optimized in the newborn infants. Now, another aspect of why it is so important to make sure that we have optimal gut biome is that what's happening is this is where we establish the epithelial barrier and your blood brain barrier. So the barrier of your gut to make sure that things that you don't want going out or things that you don't want going in can't cross that barrier. Same thing for the blood brain barrier. Now, the structure of your intestinal barrier is formed and established by the end of the first trimester. And this is where you could start to see that it's important to have a gut biome in utero. Now, the gut biome, the microbes, the bacteria produce short chain fatty acids that are used to create the tight junction proteins. So this is one of the most important roles of your gut biome or the bacteria, is to create the proteins to maintain your epithelial barrier. 
if you've ever heard of a leaky gut, what that is, is that you've lost the integrity of your tight junctions and the barrier, and it's now allowing things to go in and go out of your gut. Think nutrients that you're trying to absorb don't get absorbed as well. And then perhaps bad bacteria can actually go into your gut. And a lot of the bacteria in your gut can actually be pro-inflammatory. And then that leads to the cascade of many other things we're going to speak about. So really important to have an optimal epithelial barrier that is linked to your gut biome and that starts in utero. Leaky gut, already mentioned that. So this is, think of it again, it's an inflammatory condition. It's associated with anxiety and depression. So you can start to see an association of a client who's experiencing leaky gut or maybe doesn't even realize it and also happens to be diagnosed with depression or anxiety associated with a lot of inflammation. Inflammation is associated with many mood disorders. Inflammation is associated with accelerated aging. Inflammation is just equal to the aging process. They're not going to recover from some of their injuries or if they have surgery. Um, it's uh, increased rate of dementia when you have inflammation. So a goal of uh, optimal well-being is to manage your inflammation or your in inflammatory levels. It could be potentially the leaky gut that is contributing to that, and it could be a offset of the gut biome that is feeding that cycle. Again, as I mentioned, these tight junctions are also in your blood-brain barrier. So what's going into the brain and out of the brain is super important. We want to make sure that there's not any bad bacteria that is getting into your brain or crossing the blood-brain barrier. So what is one of the top causes, number one causes, of an increased barrier permeability? What could potentially be causing your leaky gut? Stress. Stress is one of the biggest contributors to leaky gut and a dysbiosis or a uh, loss in balance of the gut biome. Now, when you look at stress studies and what it does to gut biome, there's a there's different types of stress. One of the types of stress that is often studied is what's called restraint stress. This is an unavoidable stressful situation that causes autonomic uh, deviations, uh, increased in body temperature, uh, shifts in the arterial pressure, uh, increases in your heart rate, and then also behavioral shifts, which induce anxiety-like behavior, restraint stress. So that's the type of stress that's having the greatest effect on the gut biome. Now, when you are stressed, acute stress, thinking you're getting into a sympathetic response, you're going into a fight or flight response. We obviously know that this is downregulating your parasympathetic system. Your parasympathetic system is 90% made up of your vagus nerve. So if you are downregulating your vagus nerve, what is that going to do to the body? And then you're also getting a chronic stress state, which is a stimulation of the HPA axis, which causes a release of cortisol. So you're sitting in fight or flight, you have a cortisol response. This is where a lot of people in um, today's society are sitting. I did a whole webinar uh, a couple months ago on stress. You can find it on the YouTube channel, youtube.com backslash EBFA fitness. It was entitled Stress and the Polyvagal Theory. You can check that out to learn uh, quite a bit more on the vagus nerve and stress responses. But essentially, that is what's happening. Now, when you're looking at optimal gut biome, optimal gut brain axis. The key communicator between your gut and your brain is your vagus nerve. So if you're sitting in a stressed out state, sympathetic, and you're down regulating parasympathetic or vagus nerve, you're making it very difficult to optimize the gut brain communication. 
vagus nerve is what we want to be optimizing. Now your vagus nerve is the largest visceral sensory nerve. Remember I had said that your GI visceral surface area is 100 times greater than your external um, hairy skin surface area. When you look at your visceral uh, fascia or your visceral lining, you have a one to seven ratio of uh, proprioceptors to interoceptors. A majority of interoception, we again did a webinar on interoception. I actually have a whole webinar series on interoception. Your vagus nerve is really what you want to think of equates interoception. Now your gut microorganisms, your gut bacteria, can activate the, va the vagus nerve, uh, which plays a role in modifying your brain, your behavior. Now your vagus nerve is anxiolytic and anti-inflammatory. So anyone who's big in vagal tone, um, cold showers, uh, diaphragmatic breathing, chanting, fasting, reflexology, uh, whatever you're using as your vagus nerve hack to improve your vagal tone, you are essentially creating an anti-inflammatory effect. So the higher the vagal tone, potentially the lower inflammation systemically the individual would have, which is what we want. Uh, it would be your anti-aging hack. So what we're dealing with here is increased stress responses, chronic stress state leads to a increase in epithelial permeability. That means that there's a decrease in these tight junctions. You now experience leaky gut. Things go in, things go out. Bacteria that you don't want coming in comes in. It is uh, potentially toxic. It is pro-inflammatory. So now we have increased in uh, not just gut inflammation, but entire systemic inflammation. You could have uh, increased in brain inflammation, uh, accelerating the aging process, but from a mood perspective, you are now in an increased risk of experiencing depression and anxiety. And then when you start to experience depression and anxiety, it starts to feed your stress response because you're a little bit uh, heightened or sensitive to different responses and you become uh, hyper aware of your internal state and now you're in this little vicious cycle that keeps feeding itself and you can't ever get out of it. This is what we need to break. We need to break this cycle. So how can we improve our gut microbiome to reduce inflammation, mood, and stress? This is where prebiotics and probiotics would come in. For the sake of this webinar, I'm focusing a little bit more on the probiotics, but still understanding the role of prebiotics is very important. Now, the two that you're looking at, so you might be thinking, oh, yes, I, I eat yogurt, so that's, that's a good probiotic. I drink uh, kombucha. I might take a probiotic, but there's so many different bacteria, so how do we know which ones are beneficial? Um, specifically on mood and which ones should we be focusing our intake on. So many different types, so many different brands. What is the quality? What is the absorption? Should we be taking those that have to be refrigerated versus those that are shelf stable? Now the ones that you want to be focusing on are going to be these two guys. So Bifidobacterium lacto bacillus. So these are the two ones. If you remember, these were also the two that were the most important for the newborn. Bifidobacterium infantis is the one that I had referenced that was very important for establishing the HPA axis. Lactobacillus ruteri is the one that was very important in uh, it's in infants, it's in gut digestion uh, and making sure that they have established absorption of nutrients. Now, when you're talking about probiotics for the purpose of modifying mood, now we can give it a new name. It is psychobiotics. 
So these are probiotics that at a specific dosage exert this anxiolytic or antidepressant effect on the individual. So potentially all probiotics could be uh, psychobiotics. You just need to make sure you're taking the most appropriate bacterium and the strains of those bacterium. So there are certain probiotics that will have a more powerful effect on the mood if that is your goal. If your goal is more just optimizing digestion, that might be other bacterium. For the sake of this, we're focusing on mood modifying. So these will be psychobiotics. We go back to our same two guys here, the Bs and the Ls, so Bifidobacterium and Lactobacillus. Again, as I had mentioned, these are the most common ones that are found in the infant gut. They do not possess pro-inflammatory precursors. So you could consider both of these two bacterium to be anti-inflammatory. They prevent the whole cascade of the inflammatory response, which technically triggers an immune response. These are some of the key players that we want to be looking for. B. infantis, mention that. B. longum, that's another one that you want to write down or keep track of and see if you have it in your probiotics. From the uh, lactobacillus side, I had mentioned the rudery, that's one, and then there's uh, rhamnosus, Ramnosis <laughs> and L. helveticus. These are also really important when it comes to mood modifying. If you're listening to this and you're curious uh, and you happen to take certain probiotics, I encourage you to either check it out now or when you get home or after this webinar, look at the back of your probiotic and see specifically which bacteria are in the probiotics that you're taking. So this is one that uh, me and my husband take based off of what it contains. So this would technically be considered a psychobiotic. Uh, of course, psychobiotics, you don't have to have a prescription for them. Um, these are something that you can get uh, over the counter uh, and online. So if you look at this one, this one is where it's really good. So if we look at the, the contents of it, here's the L. helveticus. Right, so we saw that one, that was a great one. And then uh, Ramnosis, that's the other one that we wanna look for. So if it has both of those, great. The strain, this R0052 is one that you can actually see research around being beneficial to mood. When we look at the Bifidobacterium one, here we have the Longum, mentioned that one, which is good. Infantis, mentioned that one, right? So that's great. The Lactis is another one that you'll see uh, in some of the research. So this is why this is the one that we're taking for uh, both my husband and I having a baby stressful. So uh, having a probiotic is very important to manage our stress. All right, so which strains, when you look at the research, which strains of these uh, bacteria are specific to anxiety? These are the two ones that you can see around the research of showing the greatest effect at having an anxiolytic effect. When you're looking at the one specific for depression, this is the one, or these are the ones that are researched. There is a probiotic called Solace, S-O-L-A-C-E, which is a specific strain of the Lactobacillus plantarum. It's a specific strain, it has a number after it, and that one is, is researched and it's what's in the probiotic Solace, S-O-L-A-C-E. Um, now, some people, when you um, ask them about probiotics, some individuals um, are not a big fan of single strain probiotics, and they like more kind of a cocktail like this, where others are a little bit more specific, and they might be fine with the single strain. A vivo, from the beginning with the B. infantis, that would be a single strain. So now there's an interesting study as we kind of um, wrap up and start thinking of, you know, what is really the efficacy of using psychobiotics or probiotics to modify mood? What does the research show? Um, 
how does it compare to perhaps some of the medications that you know our family our clients our patients might be on um, so there's a study that was done and initially it was a rat study and then they uh, repeated similar with a human study and what it was is it's looking at the effect of an antidepressant versus psychobiotic the antidepressant that they were using in this specific study was an SSRI like Prozac, um, Zoloft, Lexapro. Um, those are some of the most highly prescribed antidepressants, um, especially here in the US. So those were up against the probiotics. Now what they did in this study is they did, they created a stressor and the stressor that they created was uh, with an infant uh, in the rat study, the pup, they did a maternal separation. So the maternal separation is one of the most stressful uh, situations that you could create for the uh, specific pup. And what they saw is that when they separated the pup from the mother, there was a definite uh, stress response, and that was noted by increase in inflammatory markers such as interleukin-6 and they also saw an amygdala stimulation so an upregulation of the amygdala uh, and an increase in inflammatory markers then they gave the pups either the antidepressant ssri or the psychobiotic and what they saw is a similar effect between the psychobiotic and the antidepressant, that they could actually not tell a difference between which one was taken, which is really interesting. When they repeated that with the human study, they saw very similar patterns as far as the effect of the psychobiotic. Now, the way that that can be measured is very similar to what they did in the rats, is that you can tell if someone is stressed, if a baby is stressed, an individual is stressed by measuring their inflammation. The higher the inflammation, meaning uh, either looking for the individual markers, um, TNF alpha, interleukin six, you could measure the marker or you could measure CRP um, or ESR, which are other inflammatory markers. If you're curious of your own inflammation levels, you can have those done with your um, medical doctor and they can actually see how potentially uh, stressed or not stressed you might be. So to have that back-to-back -back study, both rat studies and human studies, to show the support of the power of psychobiotics, I think is really important to start um, appreciating and taking proactive steps of taking specific probiotics based off of their mood modifying application. Now, how do we start to use this information as movement specialists, as allied health specialists? You know, how can you use this with your clients? Some things that I want you to start thinking about with it is if you're dealing with your client and their stress levels, if a client is coming in to work out with you, they you train with them a couple times a week and they're continuously stressed out, they come to your session and you can absolutely tell that they're they're breathing super di diaphragmatically, they're in a you know fight or flight state. They're not getting what they need to out of that session. Your ability to modify and impact their uh, quality of life exceeds beyond just uh, losing a few pounds from training them, you know, a couple times a week. Are there some tips or recommendations for stress management, getting the stress levels down, making suggestions around nutrition? Um, you're not telling them exactly which um, probiotic to take unless if you have the license to do that, but understanding that part of your nutrition recommendations should be built around probiotics and optimizing their gut biome. If you talk about anything vagal tone related, understand the importance of optimal gut biome on vagal tone. So if you're doing different things with your clients to increase vagal tone, cold showers, 
um, diaphragmatic breathing, uh, chanting, humming, things like that, but they're not doing anything to optimize their gut biome, you're kind of taking one step forward and half a step back. So we wanna make sure that we're fully uh, encompassing everything that we should be to optimize vagal tone. This of course ties into the biopsychosocial method and um, some of the psychosomatic conditions that you might be seeing in clients or patients. And then of course controlling inflammation, which is linked to accelerated aging and mood uh, imbalances, dementia, etc. All right, so I hope that you guys enjoyed what you went what i just went through this is a teaser into the full session that i'm doing at the brain awakening series october 26th in arizona as well as online if you're curious on how you can access it online or register for the online all of that information is on barefootstrongsummit.com if you use code webinar, you would get $50 off of the Barefoot Strong Summit when you go to our online platform where you can sign up for just the Brain Awakening or we're also doing Pelvic Balance. You can, you don't have to take both of them. You could do just the Brain Awakening or you could do just the Pelvic Balance. If you are uh, thinking of attending in person in Arizona, same thing. You could just attend Saturday or you could just attend Sunday. If you are registering, please use that code webinar. If you have any questions, please do uh, uh, type those in and we'll go through and answer any of those questions. Again, if you think of a question after the fact, you can always email me education at ebfafitness.com. If you want a copy of this PowerPoint, please email me education at ebfafitness.com. This will be on the EBFA YouTube channel uh, tomorrow morning. So if you want to listen to it again, you may do so. So we have a question, is the probiotic taken between or with meals? So I like to take my probiotics with the meal. Um, oftentimes you can see that the meal that you take it with or the food that you take it with can actually um, optimize the, uh, the breeding of it, uh, which takes me to the prebiotic that I didn't mention. And this will, this will answer the question. So the prebiotic, if you're taking a prebiotic with a probiotic, there are um, certain oligosaccharides or sugars that the bacteria feeds off of. So if you're not taking a prebiotic with a probiotic and you actually want to eat with the probiotic, then you are optimizing the, uh, the feeding of the bacteria. I hope that makes sense. Um, so they don't have to be taken with food. Some people, when they take probiotics, can get a little bit um, gassy from it. So you do want to make sure that uh, if you have a sensitivity to some of them, or what you can also sometimes notice is that when you take some of the probiotics initially and you're getting gassy um, or you're getting a little bit upset stomach, some people will then stop taking the probiotic, but you actually want to keep taking the probiotic to allow your body to normalize to the probiotic. So you kind of have to stick it out a little bit through that uncomfortable period uh, for some of the individuals. Um, does the Garden of Life mood have dairy in it? Um, that's actually a really good question. I don't know. Um, you can, of course, go to the Garden of Life website and they would be able to tell you if they have dairy in it. I'm not, I'm not sure. So if you have a dairy intolerance, um, please do check that out. I'll give you another moment if anyone has any other questions on that um, for uh, 
the question on should the probiotic be taken with food, uh, what's interesting is the Avivo one, which is the B infantis, feeds off of the sugars in breast milk. So you actually want to take that with a feeding. So you would mix it in a in breast milk. So you're obviously feeding the bacteria. You're giving the probiotic to the baby and then you're breastfeeding. So that's an example of very specific uh, food that feeds or is known to feed the bacteria. Probably some of the prebiotic, probiotic mixtures um, you may not need to take with food. Okay, thank you guys so much for, oh, there's a one last question and then we'll, we'll wrap up. Is there a better time of day to take them? No, not really. When you look at the research, there's not a consensus of, you know, this needs to be taken in the morning or this is in the evening. Um, you know, I tell my patients to take it in their, with their first meal of the day um, so that they're consistently taking it. If you're taking them at night, or in between meals, you know, as long as it's consistent uh, with probiotics, with all supplements, I like to take them consistently at the same time of day. Um, so if it's, you know, roughly 8 a.m. every day that you're taking them, I try to keep them um, a little bit systematic on how they're taking them. But again, morning versus evening. If you do find that you're taking some of the probiotics and it's giving you some of the initial gas, you might not want to take it in the evening, just in case if you get some of the, the effects from it. Good question, though. Again, if you think of a question, please email me, education at ebfafitness.com. Otherwise, I thank you all so much for tuning in. If you're listening to the recording, thank you so much for uh, listening. To learn more about EBFA and our education, please head to ebfaglobal.com. Thank you all so much. Have a wonderful evening or a great day, depending where in the world you are.